This is Duke University. If you're looking to stand out in the modern economy, you really need a powerful idea that you are associated with. You can't rely on mere celebrity. You really do need to have a breakthrough idea that adds value and contributes to other people. In my book, Stand Out, I interviewed about 50 top thought leaders and dug into the process of how they developed their breakthrough ideas. And there are commonalities. There's not one right way to do it, but there essentially is a, a smorgasbord of methods that people use to bring them to the ideas that enable them to really move their field forward. One is having a niche strategy. They don't immediately try to become an expert in the most general version of their field. It would be incredibly hard to become an expert in sports or an expert in politics. Those categories are far too big. Instead, it's far more useful and successful of a strategy for you to pick a small niche that you can own and dominate and gain credibility in. Instead of sports, focus on badminton. Instead of politics, focus on the New Hampshire primary. And get known, write about that, create content, and become a trusted source. Once people realize that you know what you're talking about and you're authoritative, they will begin to come to you for other things and you can steadily and incrementally expand your footprint and what you're known for. And therefore, you can develop a broad-ranging expertise. Another strategy is combining different subject areas. Oftentimes, the root of creativity comes from bringing together two disparate elements that have not previously been brought together. In Standout, I profile a gentleman named Eric Schott, who is today one of the world's best known scientists. What's interesting to me about him is that he actually got his start not in biology, where he is currently working, but actually in mathematics and computer science. And it was only when he shifted over to biology that he was able to bring in a new perspective that at the time was really revolutionary in the world of biology, and that is the quantitative undergirding that he had that enabled him to become one of the earliest proponents of using big data in biology. Today, most people understand and appreciate that big data has a lot to contribute to different fields, especially science. But early on, there was a great deal of skepticism, and it was only because of Eric's early quantitative training that he was able to appreciate what big data could do in terms of advancing medical science. In today's environment, where individuals can now write their own blogs, create their own podcasts, self-publish their own books, it's now increasingly possible for people to become well-known, even become celebrities in their respective fields, and yet not make any money from doing it. So my new area of study is how you can leverage your expertise and turn that into a sustainable career and be able to really monetize your ideas. Before you monetize, you have to build an audience. And that involves consistently producing high quality content. It doesn't necessarily have to be written content, although that's one possibility. It could be videos, it could be podcasts. There are a variety of different ways. But what matters is that on a regular basis, your audience begins to count on receiving information from you and learning valuable things that they are proactively wanting to make the time for and seek out. For instance, John Lee Dumas is an entrepreneur who created a podcast called Entrepreneur on Fire. He decided that he would create one podcast every single day, which was a sharp departure from most podcasts, which are weekly or perhaps even less frequent. He was able, as a result of that, to do two things. One, he built exponentially more connections because he was interviewing people every single day who all had followings of their own. When their episode would appear, they would tweet it out, they would share it, and it would grow John's audience. The second thing is if a typical podcast is weekly, it's therefore downloaded four times a month by an individual subscriber. John's podcast was downloaded 30 times a month which meant that he was able much more rapidly to increase the rate of downloads and therefore his ability to monetize his subscribers through advertising revenue. 
Those things have enabled him to build a large enough following that he was able subsequently to create a mastermind group uh, for which people are paying thousands of dollars in membership, and also a group called Podcasters Paradise, which is an online membership community that costs $1,200 to join. As a result, he's now bringing in staggering amounts of money, up to nearly $600,000 per month, based on the strength of his podcast, but monetizing in a host of different ways. When it comes to monetizing your ideas, the first step is recognizing that it's gonna take a while before that becomes possible. You first need to build trust with your audience. You often need to share your expertise for free for a while, whether it's in the form of blogs or podcasts or other content. That enables people to go to you as a trusted source and recognize that you have something worth contributing. But at a certain point, that becomes unsustainable. You can't keep creating free content forever, and so, it's useful to scan the horizon and to begin to understand the possible ways that you can monetize. If you have a podcast, for instance, once you hit a threshold of approximately 10,000 downloads per episode, you can typically begin monetizing through advertisements or sponsorships. Another possibility is monetizing around the ways that you're communicating with your audience. So for instance, you may be blogging regularly and that might be the principal way that you are creating and sharing content. But that might not become ultimately a revenue stream for you. Instead, it becomes a form of advertising and potential customers and clients may come to you about speaking engagements or coaching and consulting because they now trust you enough to know that your services are well worth the price. Once you've built an audience, it's useful to build your direct experience by providing services on a smaller, typically one-to-one -one or small group basis. If you're looking to position yourself as a marketing expert, it's extremely useful for you to take on clients in your local area or to do coaching with other people so that you can practice and hone your skills on a small, low-pressure level. It's only then that later on you move to leveraging your expertise at a higher level on the internet. I think that far too many people immediately rush to try to create big brands. They see the lure of multi-million dollar launches on the internet and think, oh, I should be doing that. And it is possible for, for almost anyone who has the hard work and builds up the credentials over time, but you can't immediately jump into that. There's an essential step, and that's gaining the experience in a very tactical, one-on-one, -on -one, roll up your sleeves way, so that you know what real customers face and the challenges on the ground. And it's only then that you can build up a large enough audience and have the, the real skills and advice to be able to add value to thousands or tens of thousands of people at a time. In my first book, Reinventing You, I talked about the process of how to reinvent yourself into the career that you want. How do you get to the place where you really want to make a contribution professionally? In my second book, Stand Out, I focused on how to become a recognized expert in your field. Once you're in the company or in the career that you want, how do you get known as the best of the best, as a person who really has something to bring to the table and who others want to make sure that they are working with? But a huge challenge is that today, even if you're recognized as an expert, the ways that people monetize their expertise have dramatically changed and we need to get smart and strategic about it because it, unfortunately it's entirely possible for people to be well-regarded experts and yet not make any money off of their ideas. If we want thought leadership to become sustainable, we need to understand and get very clear on how people today can monetize their expertise so that they're able to share their ideas with the world, but also create a comfortable living for themselves that enables them to continue developing those ideas and making a difference.